Hi everyone, my name is Kimberly and welcome to another day on Ray of Jokay, where each new day is an opportunity to slay. Hope you all are staying healthy, well, and blessed and having a spooktacular Halloween. Going with a little bit of low lighting today so you guys can see my pumpkin and also goes with the spooky theme here. As you may have already seen from the title, today I plan to indulge in my obsessions in horror and cinema uh, by speaking about a horror movie icon that I'm sure a lot of you out there know. The Exorcist. So as far as my obsession about scary stuff, horror stuff, I don't know where it really started. I think I've just had, for a long time, even when I was a kid, I just had a, a large fascination for mystery, suspense, things that deal with paranormal, um, supernatural, like all of that just, um, it, it was just an obsession of mine that I wanted to learn more and more about it and obviously respect it. You know, I do believe that there are other energies besides our own in this universe. I love learning about it, but respect it from afar. Now, why am I talking about this topic? Uh, one, again, I get to indulge in my obsessions, but also I figured I would tie this into, you know, the whole concept behind this channel with personal growth, um, personal development, and um, personal um, care. So, uh, so all of this would come together to hopefully bring about a bigger message and at the same time we have fun a little bit with this topic. Now um, as far as the movie The Exorcist there have been many adaptations of this movie however I'll be mainly referencing the OG of them all which was the 1973 version of this movie. So as far as the origin story of The Exorcist um, because um, I think oftentimes, and I was the same way when I first watched the movie, I first I thought I maybe it wasn't necessarily based on a real event, it was just Hollywood magic. As like um, the adaptations came about, I was starting to think maybe there was some truth to it. Um, and it's kind of half and half. So there was an incident, and I believe this was the 1940s, um, where um, a boy um, did end up getting an exorcism due to um, a possession. He, his real name hasn't been published, they just named him Roland Do Doe, Roland Doe. And that incident inspired the book that was, uh, the movie, The Exorcist that we know today was based on. So the movie was based on the book, the book was based on the real event. Obviously, as adaptations go, things change and get rearranged with the times and the relevance of um, the story in today's day and age and telling that story. Um, but that's pretty much how this phenomenon began. And as I was learning about the making of The Exorcist, which is actually really interesting, and I'll you know include some links of, of things that I watched just to gain a little bit more insight into it. There were a few things that I did know, but just seeing how they made even the special effects and everything was really cool. Uh, so I'll include that in the description below. But originally when they were uh, looking to uh, make the movie, of course, it was kind of met with initial rejection. So the original screenwriter, uh, he um, was more well versed in the, uh, comedy, but um, he, you know, kind of with life brought him to try and see if he could um, build up a story in the horror genre, something different. Um, and originally when this story was pitched to Hollywood, you know, they were just met with rejection, whether it was they couldn't really see the concept being made to screen or the concept that it concepts that it did deal with, um, like with the Catholic Church, with um, spiritual stuff, possessions, like maybe that was something that they were also um, a little hesitant to open Pandora's box to because sometimes controversial topics can cause a little bit more trouble than it's worth. So that could have probably played into it. But of course, being Hollywood, they're looking to see, can they sell this, right? And I think more so it was just, they couldn't see it as something that would garner enough attention to bring in the box office numbers. So it was a little bit of a rocky start, but you know, um, that aside, they built up the script and everything. And now we have a horror movie phenomenon. Uh, and it was really interesting to learn about the special effects too. Like for instance, I didn't know that, um, like uh, if you can see in the movie, um, you can see people's breath at one point um, while they're in the girl's room, just to, again, kind of show that effect of this entity draining the energy of the environment. And of course, because it's using up all the energy in its environment, it is um, causing a temperature change. And I'm sure you guys are aware of that from, you know, ghost hunters and all that stuff, um, like drawing energy from something, but also science, I mean. 
But anywho, um, they use refrigerators um, on set. Like they got huge refrigerators, um, lined them all on set just to create that effect. And of course, uh, the cast was cold as heck, but you know, um, they did amazing considering the circumstances, like to be able to still act under those temperatures is a feat that I cannot imagine. So they, they did a good job, but that was interesting. Also another interesting fact that I learned about was apparently, so the, <laughs> Um, you have the little girl's voice, and then you have her de demonic voice. The demonic voice was actually played by a woman who actually grew up in Joliet, Illinois. And, oh man, I'm blanking on the woman's name. I'll, I'll, I'll probably, like, show it here somewhere in the video. I linked her story in the um, description because I thought it was... It was interesting how she got her voice ready for that role. Um, apparently we can claim the OG demon voice of the exorcist. That's one of the things. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it was a fun fact. But yeah, she had to put her um, self under a lot of strain in order to get the voice. So definitely listen to that story. As far as um, kind of discussing the response. Now the response is interesting. There was the reception for this movie when it first came out. So the reaction I mean, they expected people to be scared. There was a bit of a frenzy um, around this movie when it came out. Uh, like, more and more people, of course, were turning to the church or religion after this movie. Well understood. Um, but people were even fainting, vomiting, or feeling, like, unease in the theaters. So, yeah, overall, um, it was a very interesting response. But one thing that The Exorcist, in my opinion, I believe did very well was that it kind of pioneered this new type of monster. It's not like there weren't any monster films that came about before it, like you have Frankenstein, you have um, Dracula. So you have those that preceded it, of course, but it was kind of the first film of its kind. No one had really seen anything like this before, and it set the precedent for movies like it that followed. Um, not just its adaptations, but also just the storytelling of like spirits, ghosts, demonic energies. Like it, it kind of set the stage for that and again like it, it makes us kind of be confronted with this new type of monster something that can hide in plain sight um it doesn't require necessarily a physical entry point it's purely spiritual but you know it, it brought about an untapped area of belief into pop culture because it kind of brings the extraordinary to the forefront of the seemingly ordinary like for instance in the exorcist we're introduced to a perfectly normal family and then pretty soon we're thrust into the spiritual universe where it's like good versus evil type thing like forces beyond our understanding fighting against each other in a world that we can't really see so in that sense it it invites some interview some um you know it has kind of a seductive element because it's inviting in terms of making us see what's very familiar but then of course as the story develops there is an exploration into the deepest and darkest parts of our humanity and that's what i'm going to be talking about today it's those elements that i feel that the movie did not only well but then it also got me thinking a lot about when we're looking at our internal battle what like what is that process and so you know we're going to go into that a little bit here uh, so first off, I did a video um, regarding energies, just how to better protect your own sphere of energy, and I'll go ahead and link that also in the description so you can get to it. You know, I think that's very important, uh, regardless of what you believe. So I, I want I want to set the stage here. Like, if you don't believe in this stuff, that's what you know. That's your prerogative. That's fine. I'm probably going to be speaking a little bit from my belief, but I'll try and make it a, as relatable as possible and of course if you believe in this stuff then you know i guess more power to you but it's not really about belief in these things per se i think we can all agree that there's energies in our universe and some of them we might understand a little bit better and some we just don't um and there and regardless these are energies that we can't really see so there's only so much that we can test within the scientific method because Again, it's th these are a lot of things that we can't really see. But I do believe that with inviting, you have the ability to invite different energies to influence you and your life. Um, in a sense, it opens up kind of this spiritual door and you don't really have any assurances that you've closed it or not, or, you know, again, it's in a realm we can't really see. So again, we can invite negative energies around us, positive energies around us, this is not groundbreaking. But as far as harmful energies. Let's kind of talk about that because, of course, we were referencing The Exorcist. It was more of a harmful energy that came into the seemingly normal home. Outside of that, like harmful energies around us, they don't look harmful in the beginning because if they did, then we would want to avoid them. It would just be a gut reaction to avoid them. So harmful energies, harmful people, 
um, harmful things don't always make themselves to be dangerous at first. Usually they're inviting, they, they charm you, um, they appeal to your deepest desires um, in order to be invited in. So just kind of keep that in mind as you interact in your world that sometimes it's not so apparent. And I think recognizing that comes with, you know, deeper levels of introspection, reflection, all of that plays into it. Um, so you're better able to maybe recognize it or if anything, if it is in your life, um, deal with it um, in a way that empowers you. Now, what I found interesting, because again, we're talking about the exorcist, uh, stages of possession. So again, this is not whether you believe possession, exorcists, all that. Like, I want to focus on things that is relatable into our everyday life. So I'm going to focus on just, you know, the ideas of energies. Um, and, you know, believe it or not, en negative energies do exist. Um, whether it comes from a person or an entity, they exist. Now, this is just like playing on power dynamics, right? With possession. It's really about um, infiltrating and submission. So there's a power dynamic at play. And as far as possessions in the um, school of thought around exorcisms, there are slightly different ideas on how such energies can infect someone's life. You know, I did find some stages that seem to adequately depict the process. So uh, I'm going to first explain them and then I'm going to kind of tie that into how we see energies in our own life manifest. So speaking of manifest, that is the first stage, manifestation. So this is when that energy makes itself known. Um, again, it might not be blatantly obvious, but um, it might be just a slight difference or something that you just notice. It, it grabs your attention in some way, shape or form, but it is the first instance that it appears in your life. So think about it as an introduction. Now for infestation, now that it's introduced itself some of the effects of that energy kind of shows itself subtle it's very subtle i'm um, still at this stage but it shows itself in different ways um, that begin to kind of infect your daily life and i say infect because it will it will leave little like breadcrumbs of impact not enough to throw you into chaos but enough to like start to maybe affect your mood um your energy levels like um so there's different ways of this happening, but again, very subtle. Uh, the next stage is oppression. Um, so at this point in time, the level of presence is a lot more. It's kind of the beginning stages of sub, um, subjugation because it's almost like, think of it as a bully. Like they um, maybe like take your lunch or I don't know, like um, trip you, like all of this stuff to make you see that, that like they are the boss. So that is what oppression in this case is. It's all of these things just to kind of isolate you, take away your position of strength and really put you in a weaker spot. So that way you're left more vulnerable. Writing with this one, um, at this point you've, you feel defeated because this overwhelming energy is just kind of put you into this spot where you're forced to bow to it. So writing like i guess think of it as riding a horse the person riding the horse um they have like they can direct the horse so in that sense and like the horse has no choice but to kind of accept its role now horses are powerful I, i'm not i'm not i'm not going to deny that but i'm just painting a picture so you kind of understand what this is going it's like you feel like there's no other way out or other options so you kind of consign yourself to what is happening around you so that's writing bull possession at this point this energy has full control over your life. You no, know, for me, I'm kind of torn with energies having full control over your life because I'm just like, I feel that deep down we still have control. It's just a matter of whether we let other people or other things take that control from us. So we essentially give them permission to do that. And that rests with us. So, you know, I have a different thinking from that, but as far as full possession, they've essentially have control. There's even different schools of thought about the full possession, like um, a complete possession or um, kind of a resonance or coexistence where um, s uh, someone like willingly like invites the control. Um, again, kind of going back to what I was saying about we can give up the control. It's a little bit more willing rather than having to be forced. But, you know, I won't go into that full possession. It is what it is. Um, but, you know, that's that is the end of the stages. Now, as far as the human condition, which is what I'm going to go into next, now that we've set up the stage of this spiritual tug of war, now let's kind of discuss the human condition. There were a few things that I found to be interesting. One was um, kind of the concept of 
like heaven hell and our relationship with reward and punishment and you know kind of just exploring this dichotomy of good and evil and i know that's a lot of words <laughs> a lot of big concepts but um, i'm going to try and break them down as much as i can so oftentimes i like we i know that we see this as separate but now with the movie the exorcist for instance like the idea of possession it's kind of like these two things coming together into one in one vessel like you have the priests uh, quoting the word praying over um, this person who's possessed and then you have the entity that's inside this person who is fighting back so you kind of see these two different things but they kind of come together in this one um, vessel and at least my thoughts on the idea of um, punishment and reward in relation to heaven or hell I feel that it's less about like certain works that you do granted like obviously be a good person I'm not saying like I, I don't think I have to do the premise of like don't take this as permission to be a completely negative person but I believe that it's maybe more about redemption and forgiveness within ourselves and the reason I say this is because of how in um possessions it seems like the demon plays off of this inner conflict that we have with ourselves like points where we didn't either forgive ourselves for certain things or didn't feel like we were redeemable and it kind of plays on those instances so with redemption and forgiveness it first begins with recognition and acknowledgement and the more that we refuse to acknowledge these things that happen in our life that we have kind of this internal regret um, towards, I feel like that's what really darkness in ourselves preys upon. Um, it preys upon the darkest parts of ourselves that we reject or refuse to acknowledge as being part of us. And all of us have light and dark, and I'm sure you've heard that quote before many times, but it's true. We, we all have light and dark in ourselves. We all have good and bad in ourselves. So that's why I think it's less of a dichotomy um, outside of us and more of more internal um, and in relation to forgiveness, redemption, just um, a feeling of completeness of wholeness within ourselves and as far as like the fact that we reject these things we, this energy surfaces it to the level that we can no longer deny it so these are usually things we try to hide from the world around us um, even from ourselves we try to not acknowledge it because it's just easier to do that it's easier to hide that and you know not really be truthful to ourselves that is the easy route but of course, the more that we hide it and the more this negative energy sees that this deeply affects us, it's going to try and surface that. So I found that to be really, really interesting. Another thing that is done and, you know, the movie portrays very well, especially when it comes to um, the priests that are praying over the girl, it, it, it goes at the roots of attacking our faith or belief structure by sowing seeds of doubt. So this really comes with like fear of uncertainty. Um, and there are a lot of things that us as humans are not certain of, but as far as in our own lives, we have doubts about actions that we take, about uh, moves that we make in our lives, that it's like, was this the best option? Um, could I have maybe made a better option? So it's really the second guessing um, where some of these seeds of doubt really take root. And the more doubt that you put in, um, the more uncertain about yourself that you'll become, the more detached from yourself that you'll become, because you're always kind of fighting this inner battle within yourself. Um, a lot of deep stuff, I know, but <laughs> areas of uncertainty can be found in confusion. It can be found in inner conflict. Like I said, that was kind of already present. It's just now it's surfacing that and it's instigating it and kind of adding fuel to the fire. Now that we have this kind of foundation of what it does, like attacking faith or seeds of doubt. Now let's kind of start talking about how, um, it works. So one um, of the themes that I noticed was the power of isolation. With um, the weakening of a person's spirit, it kind of leads to a growth of negative energy, emotion, where these things really thrive. It's creating an environment for itself to thrive, like, like a virus, really. Like a, a virus attacks your system, it attacks your cells. It creates a hospitable environment for it to thrive and grow. Now with the power of isolation, what this does is that as this thing is growing inside, like in, in power and energy, it's getting fed, um, that will start to take a toll on the world outside, in your outside environment, which is um, one of the first things that will be uh, targeted, of course, is relationships that you have with people. It would lead to a deterioration of those relationships and kind of putting you in a disempowering spot 
as your de connections uh, decline with people, it'll also kind of affect your mental health too, because um, regardless of like, look, I'm an ambivert, so I have both extroverted moments and introverted moments, but even for people who garner their energy from just being by themselves, like we all are still social creatures by nature. So we all have the capacity to be social. So going back to what I was saying, um, this sense of um, cutting off your connections, cutting off your relationships, and you know, creating more mental health, it's kind of a cycle that feeds into itself as your health declines, then you might be more erratic in your everyday interactions with people and people might be a little bit deterred about being around you because you're a lot more erratic. And then it feeds into your mental health because now you're like, oh, I'm not, um, I'm not good enough. I'm not, you're like all of these self-deprecating things that you say in your head would put you in that spot. Um, and it creates a sense of vulnerability um, by disarming and manipulating um, this sense of security, this security blanket that you have, which, um, you know, is the people that you have in your life that do bring positive to you. Um, removing that um, puts you in a very disarming spot. And I do also want to discuss that there was a point in time too where like the demon and the girl was kind of, it seemed like it was getting weaker and weaker to the point where it would leave. But sometimes it can be a trick um, in order to let down your guard. Uh, so that also can re remove a sense of security. When like in the times where maybe um, you're going through things and then you notice things are get beginning to get better and better, you might just be tempted to like, okay, now whatever I was doing to get out of that funk or out of that negative space, I'll just throw it to the wind because obviously I'm better now. But when that happens, it, it could be that you have a relapse and often, I mean, we're human. So there is gonna be cycles of ups and downs that we have in our life. So if you take that moment of, you know, I'm feeling good and I'm not saying like, don't celebrate, like obviously celebrate that moment, but I'm saying don't cast away the stuff that kind of got you to that spot. Um, whatever you did, whether it was meditation or uh, changing up your thinking, changing up your habits, don't let that go just because you're in a good spot because there will be a time where it could come back and it will likely come back because again, we deal with ups and downs, it's just part of life. And then you no longer have that security to lean on to. You've completely dropped your guard. And to build something up, and I'm speaking from experience, to build something up from the beginning, after you've let it go, it is, it's hard. Um, it requires time and you have to build up that discipline again. So um, I also wanna point that out too. This whole situation of isolating us now puts us in a spot where we're made to confront our own helplessness and uncertainty. And it, it's kind of an unmasking of ourselves to us. So we have really two paths to choose whether we acknowledge it or continue to try and put up those walls, which is what this darker energy <clears throat> or negative energy thrives on. Okay, so with vulnerability, I want to talk a little bit about that too. Um, and I feel that vulnerability kind of exists on a spectrum of open-mindedness and closed-mindedness. Um, and I say a spectrum of these two things because I don't feel like one is any better than the other. There are pros and cons to both on the absolute extremes of this spectrum. Um, leaving ourselves too open or completely closing ourselves off um, can make these energies easily manipulate us. Obviously with being too open, you're more inviting. Um, you're not really scrutinizing those energies that come into your life. So, I mean, that's self-explanatory. They can really run amok when you just have open arms and you don't really have any questions of your mind of like trying to understand like what is this energy doing here like why do I why should I allow it permission into my life um, just asking yourself those questions can you know begin the process of just being able to develop a healthy skepticism now being too skeptic that's what I'm going to talk about that's being too skeptic or closing yourselves off completely can also make you vulnerable despite what people think it will make you more vulnerable because you're relying more on pride you it's like when you're confronted and you see this in movies all the time especially scary movies like the mo the highly skeptic person confronted by something that they can clearly see but because they're so rooted in their beliefs or skepticism they're not willing to even accept what they can see in front of them so of course whatever they can see in front of them can um, trick them in different ways and can even appeal to their pride in order to do what it is they want so i want to stress that balance <laughs> all the time. Balance is key in anything and everything that you do. Try and find a healthy medium. Of course, you know, develop an open mind to learning, but then also at the same time, develop a healthy skepticism to questioning, challenging. So that way you're just more well-rounded and you're protecting yourself at the same time. 
All right, so now kind of going into mental health and possessions. Now I talked about mental health uh, a lot on my channel. Um, I even dedicated a video specifically to kind of like a bare bones introduction into mental health, our perceptions, our relationship with mental health. So I'll also put that in the description so you can easily find it too in case you're interested in watching that. But as far as mental health and possession, it's had its interesting history. So. I'm going to try and break these down um, to how I came to understand the relationship between these two things. But I just wanted to acknowledge that there is a lot of history that goes into these. Um, so I might not be able to touch on everything, but I'll do my best. There was a history, a point in time where like those who did suffer from actual mental illness were perceived to be possessed by spirits. And even in some places of the world today, it's still that's still the thought process, um, just because there's not really an in-depth understanding about mental health. So that history is there. But when it comes to the idea of possession, um, now I already talked about this idea of the deteriorating mind, because of course you're put into a place that you've either rejected or um, you've hidden, and that can put you at odds in you know in a weird and detrimental mental state if you're not ready to confront it and it's being surfaced um, forcibly. So it can also produce mental illness and then also if, like the portrayals in movies for instance um people with mental illness we've seen them more susceptible to these possessions or demonic attacks so it's like it's very it's very circumstantial it's really a case by case i don't think we can honestly say one beats all um like possessions are just mental illness or that mental illness um causes a higher root of possession like i think it's really just it's it's a hodgepodge of things that are interacting with each other um, because all of this again is internal so i think it's really by taking it a case by case and really looking at the roots of how it's developing understanding how like this person is interacting with their environment how the environment is interacting with that person to really understand what begin to diagnose what it is but i will say that i know for exorcists it is at this point in time like they're required um to have like um, a psychologist um, like consulting on the mental well-being of this person one being like because of the nature of an exorcism it can take a toll on a person um, so of course they want to rule out any possibilities before they turn to exorcism as kind of a last resort want to make sure this person isn't just mentally ill um, so they do uh, you, they do their due diligence and you know a lot of instances with um, exorcisms where they kind of deduce the root cause. Um, now it might not have been like that, um, you know, earlier um, in earlier instances of exorcisms, but you know, as time develops, as an understanding of mental health develops, I think that was that that ended up being the play. And of course, the, the church wants to cover their butts. <laughs> I don't think they want to be known for you know, com like putting this person in such a state without having done that uh, due diligence. So a lot of things at play, but um, I do want to kind of talk about like actual possession and how it feeds on the mental state because there is a difference I feel and it's very slight, but I feel there's still a difference nonetheless with uncharacteristic behavior that lies outside the realm of someone's personality and something that it can be diagnosed like diagnosable symptoms. So I I feel that there is a slight difference there. And it's just about paying attention to some of these behaviors, some of the signs um, that are being displayed. Like there is a diagnostic manual for um, certain mental health illnesses. And while it meant, while symptoms can be a little bit different from person to person, because you also have that too, you there are things that do fall under concrete diagnoses. Energy's man manipulation of the environment, I think is a telltale sign that there's something <laughs> a little bit more at play, but there are instances where maybe a person might be possessed and you don't really see physical manifestations in their environment. It's just within the person themselves. And again, you know, that can happen. Um, it, it, could, it, be, it could be tricks. It could just be the stage of possession the person is in. Um, you know, it could be a lot of things, but again, I, I there are slight differences between uncharacteristic behaviors and something that you can diagnose. Now, as far as spiritual cleansing, um, I found this to be very interesting as well, uh, because we can think about spiritual cleansing in, you know, a few different ways, but um, ultimately it seems like we're leaning on a higher power or energies, be energies beyond our own. Um, 
to bring some sort of equilibrium to our environment. And of course, in the movie, you see this with the priest leaning on God for, you know, power and guidance through prayer. And also the same goes for the girl as well, like with her faith, which is um, why, and I always kind of, I had this question in my mind too, like, does the person have to be of a particular faith in order to get an exorcism from a particular church? And this question might still be in my mind to some respects because I'm just trying to understand all of this too. But ultimately, it seems more so that the person has faith in some sort of higher power because when you're dealing with energies that are powerful than your own energy or the people that um, are in your life trying to help you their energy like in the movie clearly this entity is powerful than all the, these humans like combined it's spiritual power um, is not something that can be fought physically so um, the priests were relying on a higher power something that it would obey or um, adhere to and it's really interesting in spirituality there is this idea that a lot of these spiritual energies out there conform to some sort of hierarchy and i guess it's interesting too because it, regardless of what anyone thinks about politics or society we also conform to some sort of hierarchy it's been like that since human history these spiritual energies conform to some sort of hierarchy so wherever they are on the totem pole of strength, they will, um, begrudgingly maybe, but they will and have no choice but to be subjugated by a higher, higher power. So leaning on this higher power, you know, kind of begins with entrusting ourselves to powers beyond our own. There's this idea of the power of submission. And some people think like you have to be subservient or that's not what power of submission means. Power of submission means that we entrust something beyond us. We, we entrust it with ourselves to kind of bring some sort of equilibrium to our environment. Like it can be even in a learning aspect, like being in a classroom, we use power of submission by listening to what our teachers have to you know, teach us because they have more knowledge than us as a student at that point in time. So, you know, these different things coming to play, but it's kind of like that. That's power of submission. You're, you're letting someone else take the wheel by entrusting them with the wheel. And by doing this, you can kind of begin that process of undergoing a spiritual cleansing. I'm sure you've heard that there are things outside of ourselves that we can't necessarily control. We can only control what's in our immediate environment, what's within our capacity to control. It's the same thing here. When we kind of separate the fact that there are things that are outside of our control, so we'll leave it up to something greater to, you know, deal with that. Then we can begin to focus on ourselves with bringing and empowering us to um, respond diff to, um, to different things in our environment. Um, so again, things out of your control, leaving it up to, to faith, really. That's all it becomes. Now, as far as possessions, fact or fake, I, I, I talked about, you know, I, I talked about a lot of concepts. I, I again, try to make it as relatable as possible, to, um, depending on what your beliefs are. You are more than free to have your own belief structure. Again, this is not about belief, but about how we can incorporate these learning lessons in our daily lives. So as far as possessions, whether it's fact or fake, people tend to kind of ask the, themselves these questions. Um, like when it kind of comes down to gathering the evidence, would someone, would someone really put themselves willingly into such an ordeal? Like sometimes people say, oh, it's a prank or they're doing this for attention or maybe they're doing this out of delusion. And as far as the answer to that question, I don't, I, I don't know. I don't think there is really a way to know unless you yourself has, have gone through it. Um, but as far as someone willingly putting themselves through such an ordeal where either they're not able to sleep or to eat, um, or to you know have their relationships in their life destroyed i feel that under normal circumstances someone wouldn't want to put themselves in these instances um because of course well i mean they're putting themselves into a state where these things will only get worse i say i don't know because i know that you know self-harm is a thing and i know that's something people submit themselves to but usually people submit themselves to that when they feel there's no other way out or there's no other option so i feel like under a normal circumstance where they feel they have choices they wouldn't willingly put themselves in these instances but at the same time going along with that because I do believe there's different energies out there. I personally believe that someone wouldn't willingly put themselves through this in order to go through an exorcism. Um, that's also another taxing experience too. But in regards to kind of going back to mental health, because I, like I said, now that there's a growing understanding, a growing importance placed on this, I might be able to better differentiate between instances, these happenings. But then also just mental health in general should be the first stop towards healing. And of course, there's different ways of addressing that, whether it's seeking out support, whether it's introspection, self-reflection, changing of habits. A lot of things can be targeted in order to 
um, better take care of your mental well-being. And really, if in all else, you know, everything fails, we turn to the core of our being, which is our belief or faith structure. And again, regardless of what you believe, it is usually where we turn to for some sort of anchor. And I talk about faith and belief structures and what's our anchor, like in another video too, but it's what's your anchor. Um, but uh, as far as um, us kind of turning to faith, values, our foundation, um, it becomes our reference point with how we deal with things like loss, um, how we perceive the world around us, and essentially how we heal ourselves in both the short term and the long term. So this was a very long video. This will be interesting editing. If you enjoy this video, uh, do hit the like button. Again, I love talking about these topics. Um, clearly, I love thinking about how they intersect with daily life, our daily life. There's a lot to be learned from all of this. Who said movies can't teach you about life? <laughs> but um, yeah, if you enjoyed this, definitely hit the like button. Um, if there's a topic that you would like for me to speak more on, um, or maybe something from this video or the last video or any of my past videos that you'd like me um, to go more in depth with, um, I encourage you to let me know in the comments below. And also, if you are interested in following my journey up close, um, I post about things I'm using for my um, self-care routine, things that I do in my daily life, um, some quotes of, you know, just lessons that I pick up on my journey. I post all of that, like, on my social media pages. So if you're interested in following all of that um, up close or just interested in any um, additional content on personal growth, I have a blog that I talk a lot about um, personal growth, mindset, interested in any of that, you can find those details in the description below as well. To all of you wonderful warriors out there, I hope I gave you a good scare. Uh, but, you know, be kind, uplift one another, and like always, stay golden. <laughs>